Okay, where do I start? I've been working on the content of this video for about two months. I've done a ton of experiments, printed a lot of test prints, and I even wrote an app. What's it all about? It's about getting rid of the elephant's foot. I like to print right on the build plate. There are a lot of cases where it's just easier. And one of the projects I've been working on is an eight millimeter frame by frame film scanner. I designed all of the parts to be self-supporting and to print right on the build plate. But there was one problem, the elephant's foot. In 3D resin printing, it's that little ridge or bulge that forms around the edge that touches the build plate. And because of that bulge, some of the parts that were designed to fit together didn't. Like these gears. When I printed them on the build plate, the elephant's foot distorted the teeth of the gear and prevented them from fitting together properly. Then a few months ago, I thought of an idea. I thought of a way to print parts with a resin 3D printer right on the build plate without getting the elephant's foot. Oh yeah, and I wrote an app that sort of handles all of it for you. So stick with me. I'm going to explain in more detail what the elephant's foot is, what causes it, my methods for how to get rid of it, and then I'll tell you how you can get my app for free. All right, so if you never print right on the build plate, if you always print with supports, this might not be the video for you because I'm gonna dive into the details of this problem and how to solve it. I'm going to quickly explain what the elephant's foot is and what causes it, and then we can explore some ideas on how to get rid of it. But first, a quick refresher on how LCD printers work because we need that basis to understand the rest. On an LCD SLA printer, there's an LCD screen that displays an image of the slice we're printing. Some pixels on the LCD screen are black or solid and they block the UV light from passing through. Other pixels on the LCD screen are white or open and they allow the UV light to pass through. And then if your printer supports anti-aliasing, there might be gray pixels which would block some of the light and let some of it through. And the idea there is that those pixels are sort of an in-between and would help smooth out that pixelated look. Although it's debatable whether that really works or not. When the print starts, the empty build plate is lowered into the vat, leaving only a sliver of liquid resin between it and the LCD screen. An image of the slice is displayed on the LCD screen and the UV light underneath it is turned on. This cures the resin in the gap to match the image on the screen. This cured slice of resin sticks to the build plate, or at least it's supposed to. And then the build plate is raised up so resin can flow underneath it. And then it's lowered back down, leaving a new gap for resin. Then the next slice is displayed on the LCD screen, exposed by UV light and cured. Except that each new slice, instead of needing to stick to the build plate, has to stick to the slice before it. If you want a deeper explanation of this, check out my video on why resin prints fail. So, one of the very important parts of that process is the part where I said that the first cured slice of resin has to stick to the build plate. That has to happen. And remember, the part is printed upside down and is hanging from the build plate. So gravity is working against you. You need good adhesion or the part could fall off the build plate. Also remember that the part gets heavier and heavier as each new slice is added to it. So the bigger the part is, the better that adhesion needs to be. And the way we get that adhesion is by overexposing the first few layers. Because overexposing those slices cures the resin more deeply and makes everything stick to the build plate better. In the slicer, this option is usually referred to as bottom layers. It might also be called burn-in layers or burn layers, but here are two main settings that describe these bottom layers as it pertains to build plate adhesion. First is that you can set the number of bottom layers. How many layers are you going to overexpose? Second, you can set how long you're gonna overexpose these layers. For example, the resin I'm using today needs a 12 second exposure time. So I might specify the bottom layers to have an exposure time of 60 or more seconds. I would maybe do 10 bottom layers at 60 seconds. That's five times my normal exposure time of 12 seconds. And this overexposure causes the elephant's foot. But why? On an LCD printer, the longer a pixel is exposed, or rather the longer the resin is cured by a pixel being opened up and allowing the UV light to pass through, the more it will expand. If you underexpose it, it won't form properly and it might not stick to anything. You would get a print failure. If you expose it perfectly, it should form properly and be precisely the size it should be, the exact size of that pixel. But as you continue to expose it beyond the perfect amount of time, it will start to get larger 
and by the time you expose it 60 seconds, it's larger enough that it forms that bulge around the edge. So this is the part I was trying to print, this gear. You can see that in the grooves where the teeth meet, it's sort of webbed. And the problem here is that these two gears don't fit together like they should. So this isn't gonna work very well as a functional part. And this was the problem I set out to solve. So my idea was to take the bottom layers, the ones that would normally be overexposed, and to shrink all the shapes, erode them or contract them so that they're smaller, so that when we print them overexposed and those shapes expand from that overexposure, that the expansion is all contained within what would be the original shape. Then on that same layer, without moving the build plate, print the original shape for whatever the normal exposure time would be, so that this outer edge of the layer would print just like the other layers without any expansion. The elephant's foot would then be hidden inside of the original shape. This idea might take some trickery to pull off and there are a couple of ways to approach it. First is the double exposure or multiple exposure method. Have you seen one of these test prints where it prints several strips on the same build plate, each at a different exposure time? They might call this a resin exposure test or a range finder, but each strip on the plate is printed at a different exposure time. And the way it accomplishes this is by doing multiple exposures on a single layer without moving the build plate. Let's say you wanna print four test strips, one at 10 seconds, one at 11, one at 12, and one at 13. Without moving the build plate, you could display all four strips for 10 seconds, then three of them for another second, then two for another, and then the last one for one more second. When done, this strip would have been exposed for 10 seconds total, this one for 11 seconds total, this one for 12, and this one for 13. I call this an additive exposure method because the total exposure time for each of these strips is the sum of each of the exposure bursts. Another way to accomplish the same thing is to do it in a non-additive exposure method. In that case, you'd expose only the first strip for 10 seconds, then only the second one for 11, then only the next for 12, and only the last for 13. This method takes longer to print, but it's more accurate. These two methods would theoretically produce the same results. However, in practice, I'm not so sure they do because I'm not sure resin works that exact way. Do four bursts of three seconds each produce the same result as one single burst of 12 seconds? I'm not sure that it does, but all I can say at this point is that more experimentation is needed. And it's possible that different resins would even react differently to that sort of test. Still, the point of those rangefinder test prints is that when it's done, you can examine each of the strips to see which one looks the best and therefore hopefully determine the best exposure time for your resin. So my initial big idea on how to remove the elephant's foot was to use this type of double exposure. Take the bottom layers and first print them at the normal exposure time. Let's say that it's 12 seconds. And then contract or erode the layer in a bit. And without moving the build plate, re-expose that portion for the remainder of the time to reach the burn-in time. So to total 60 seconds, that would be 48 more seconds. Double exposure prints do work on my printer, the Frozen Transform. So I sort of assumed they'd work on all printers but I found out the hard way they don't. To say the least, it's complicated. I did a ton of testing trying this double exposure method to bust the bulge and had limited success. So I explored some other methods. What if you could figure out the exact number of pixels that your resin is expanding when printing at the longer bottom layer exposure time? If you knew the exact amount, you could contract the bottom layers of your part by the exact same amount basically cancel out the expansion on the bottom layers by pre-shrinking them by the exact same amount. The problem is that it's difficult to know exactly how much expansion will take place for any given amount of overexposure time. It's not a linear thing. However, for now, let's assume that you can derive this information for any given resin at any given overexposure setting. Because if we did know, for example, that 60 seconds produced a two pixel expansion, then you could use that to basically remove the elephant's foot by printing those layers two pixels smaller. Here's the first complication with an exact reduction method. When a pixel is printed at the right exposure setting, it should be fairly square. When you print a bed of nails test or something similar to test exposure, you look at the pegs to see that they're the right size, but also that they're square and not rounded. But when you print a pixel at a five times overexposure setting, it will be more rounded 
because that expansion happens as the UV light bleeds out and cures nearby resin particles, and light bleed doesn't follow the square corners. The other problem is that small openings are still likely to occlude. If you have a small concave opening, the light bleed comes from all around it, and when you mix that light bleed from multiple sides, it's enough to cure the opening and occlude it completely. On the other hand, if you have a small convex shape, you don't get light bleed from all around it, only from one side. So a flat or convex edge will have a smaller elephant's foot bulge than an edge that curves in or is concave. The conclusion here is that a reduction only method isn't too bad of a way to go, it can work okay, but a better way would be to reduce more than you need to so that you don't risk occluding small details and then fill in the rest of the shape another way, either with the double exposure method or with this next method. Remember I said that a pixel on the LCD panel could be black and block the UV light, could be white, which is really open or clear and pass the UV light through, or it could be somewhere in between, a shade of gray, which will pass some UV light through. So with pixel dimming, you print some portions of the slice, full white, which delivers the full level of the UV light, and then you print other portions of the slice at a gray scale, which will deliver a lower level of UV light and therefore cure those sections differently. It is sort of another way of doing a double exposure, but unlike double exposures, it's easier to do and is more compatible with a lot more printers. However, again, it is not linear. It's very difficult to guess or calculate how much less exposed the resin will be at half the brightness. To solve all of these problems, we just have to do some experiments and the app can create those test prints. Okay, so I'm gonna show you the app and go over a couple of the things that it does but first I have to take care of some business. If you haven't subscribed yet, do that now and hit the bell icon. A lot of the projects I have planned are gonna take weeks to do, maybe months, like my eight millimeter film scanner project. It's a little ambitious and I think I'm still a month away from finishing that project. And that means that I can't release videos every week or even on a regular basis. I want to, but I just can't right now. So subscribing will make sure that you don't miss anything. Okay, back to it. I need to cover one more concept real quick and then I'll get into the app. The elephant's foot is a function of two settings. First is the overexposure of the bottom layers, or more specifically, the overexposure duration, the exposure time. And the longer the exposure, the larger the elephant's foot. And the lower the overexposure, the smaller the elephant's foot. Second is the number of bottom layers that are going to be overexposed. Obviously, the more bottom layers you have, the thicker the bulge will be in the z-axis, but also the better the adhesion will be. So you could reduce the elephant's foot by reducing the bottom layer exposure time or by reducing the number of bottom layers, but I don't like this idea. The way I see it, a thicker elephant's foot means a better adhesion to the build plate, so you have to consider that, especially if you're printing something larger that is therefore also heavier because reducing either the time or the number of layers too much will reduce adhesion and could lead to a print failure. So in my opinion, it's better to use one of my methods because they don't require you to reduce the bottom layer exposure time or to reduce the number of bottom layers. In fact, if there were no impact on the physical appearance of your printed part, it might make sense to increase one or both of the values, use a longer bottom layer exposure time or have more bottom layers. If good adhesion didn't impact the part visually or physically, then you'd choose good adhesion. Let's dive into the app and I'll explain the tests that you can do with it and then how to dial in each of the three methods as we try to remove the elephant's foot. The app is called Bulge Buster. It works on a Mac or a PC and it's free. But you should also know that it is in beta, it is experimental, and you should know that it doesn't work on all printers yet it was a lot more effort than I expected to get the app even to this place, so it is sort of what it is at this point. As I find time, I will update it and add support for more printers. Also remember that so far, the double exposure method only works on the frozen transform. So if you don't have that printer, you'll want to stick with either doing the reduction only method or with the pixel dimming method. You start off by slicing a file in Cheetubox or whatever your favorite slicer is. To keep this video simple, I'm only gonna print these gears. There are a lot of different test scenarios that we could test in the app, but to keep this video more on topic, I'm going to focus on just explaining the concepts and showing how to use the app. And the gear is actually a little bit of a stress test because it has both the outside convex shapes here on the outside tips of the teeth, 
and it also has the inside concave shapes here in the creases between the teeth. And the trick is to not only remove the elephant's foot bulge, but also to prevent those concave areas from occluding, while at the same time maintaining as much of the original shape as possible on these bottom layers. Okay, also my printer is the Frozen Transform, and there are some idiosyncrasies about that printer that I don't wanna to dive too far into in this video because it is a huge rabbit hole. But you put in your layer height, lift heights, exposure, and bottom layer exposure in here, just like normal. If you see this option called transition layer count, for best results, make sure that this is set to zero. That option ramps down the exposure setting from whatever the bottom layer is to down to whatever the normal layer exposure is. And this can work to ramp down the elephant's foot as well. But since we're doing our own thing to remove the elephant's foot, just leave this at zero. But if you do have a transition in there, Bulge Buster will remove it. Now with my printer, the Frozen Transform, we don't typically have to put in our lift height or exposure times in Chitu Box. Because on the Transform, we will use a resin profile that has all that information in it. That's one of the idiosyncrasies I was talking about. However, I'm gonna put all that info in here anyway, and I suggest that if you're going to bulge bust, that you do that also, just to keep things straight. So my resin works best at 12 seconds, and then I'm gonna do 10 bottom layers at 60 seconds. So I'll slice that, and then save it. With the Frozen Transform, Cheat2Box will save it out as a .zip file, and that's fine. But when we save it out of Bulge Buster, it will be a .phz file. Okay, first you open Bulge Buster. I'm on a Mac and in dark mode, and this is where the app looks best. Here's what it looks like running on Windows. Here it says to drag a file on, so I'll drag the zip file we just saved onto here. And to be clear, you can't drag .stl or other 3D files on here. Bulge Buster is not a slicer. It is a utility app that modifies an already sliced file. And it also creates various test print files, but you can only drag on a file that has already been sliced. For now, it accepts .ctb files, .cbd, DLP files, .photon, .phz, and .zip. I will be expanding the file format support over time, but this is what I was able to accomplish so far. In Bulge Buster, there's no place to enter in any setup information about your printer. You don't need to tell it your printer's pixel or physical size. It will get all that information from the file you drag in. So even if you're using the app to create a test file, you still start by dragging in a sliced printer file. Down here in the corner is the pixel size. It also gets the layer height from there and all of this information in here. So these are the values we typed into Cheetu Box. Over here are the Bulge Buster settings. We can pick a method to do the busting and this is one of the three methods I just described. And then there are a couple of other settings. I'll tell you what those mean in a minute. And then we have a button to make a busted file. And there is a checkbox here for saving a .zip file as a .phz. So with the frozen transform, as I said, Cheetubox saves it as a zip, uh, but then that means that you have to pair it with a resin profile. And that resin profile is where it gets the exposure time, the lift height, and all the speed information. Even the layer height comes from there. It ignores the information in your G-code and builds new G-code. You may have heard that the Transform has a built-in slicer. It does not. What it does have is a built-in G-code generator. Given the zip file and a resin profile, it will generate its own G-code, basically then ignoring the G-code written by the slicer. And it does this if you have the file named zip at the end. Rename that same file to .phz, and then it will obey the G-code that's in the file. With the Bulge Buster app, we don't want the printer recreating the G-code, we wanted to use the G-code that the app writes. This will enable it to do things like the double exposure trick. So check mark this if you have a frozen transform. If not, you can uncheck it. The contract radius is the number of pixels to contract or erode the shapes. So let me show you how that works visually. Here's the bottom slice from my test print with the gears. And I have a really small gear in here as well to show the limitations of the app. Here's the original shape. Now here it is one pixel contracted and I'm showing the original shape behind it in red. So here's two pixels, three pixels, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, and 10 pixels. As we keep going up, the shapes will eventually erode until there's nothing left. You don't wanna set it so high that it would erode any of your parts completely away. 
But before we set it, we're going to run some tests to dial in what value we should use here. Eventually, I'll add a graphical view to the app so you can see how much the bottom layer is being eroded. But in a minute, I'll show you how to check it in the current version to make sure you're not eroding anything away completely. So that's the contract radius and how it works. The bust layer setting is how many slices or layers you're going to bust, or rather, how many layers you're going to contract. This is similar to a bottom layer setting. And in my opinion, it's better to go a little higher on this. Again, a higher number might be better on larger or heavier prints because this will help with overall bed adhesion. Before we bust a file, we should dial in our print settings. And we do that with some tests that are built into the app. I'm only gonna to touch on this first test really briefly. There is a resin exposure test on here that prints several test strips across the build plate, each at a different exposure setting. This test uses the double or multiple exposure method. And right now I've only been able to get that to work on the frozen transform. So if you don't have a frozen transform, use whatever method you would normally use to dial in your exposure setting. Okay, so you have an exposure setting for your resin. For the resin I'm using, this is 12 seconds. And then I'm gonna multiply that by five to get my bottom layer exposure time. So that's 60 seconds. So for my tests, I'm gonna be using 12 and 60. Next, we wanna do a reduction only test. This would help us dial in the best setting to use to do a reduction only bulge bust. Again, we first need to have a print file loaded into the app, then go up to the menu and pick bottom layer reduction test. This test is gonna print a row of test chips. From the drop down, pick reduce only. We set the layer height. I'm leaving that at 0.05 or 50 microns. You can see on the preview at the side, it shows 50 microns, 12 seconds, 60 seconds, and then a minus zero. Each chip is gonna have printed on it the print settings for whatever that chip is. So later when you remove them, you don't have to keep track of which one is which. The base height is three millimeters and the top height is three millimeters. You can make them thinner, but I suggest having them be the same thickness so the division between the two types of layers is easy to find. It will tell you here how many layers that thickness is gonna be at whatever layer height you have. The base section is shown here, and then the top section is shown up here. All 60 of these layers will be printed at the bottom exposure, or here it is listed as the base exposure. It's the same thing. But all 60 of these layers will be overexposed at 60 seconds and therefore the entire bottom three millimeters should expand like the elephant's foot. However, each chip will be contracted or reduced by some amount. We can tell it how many test chips to print. I have it set to 11 right now. Then next to contract range, you put in the low end and it will tell you the range here. It goes in one pixel increments. And I do like to set this to zero so I can see what no reduction does. This way I can see how much the elephant's foot would normally be. You can move this slider back and forth to see a preview of other chips. This first one is zero pixels. It takes a second to update the preview each time you move it, but then after you get it to render each of these chips, you can slide through it and see each of the results. Now you can see on the high end where it's 10 pixels that you completely lose the circle and this area here on the bottom right, but it's still okay to print that and see how that chip comes out. So here's the point of this test. The overexposure of the bottom half is expanding the shape and contracting it shrinks the shape. What we're attempting to do here is to find out how much contraction will exactly undo the expansion. Then you could just reduce the bottom layers of your print by that amount to remove the elephant's foot. Spoiler alert, it's going to be like two pixels, maybe three. And unfortunately, we can't go in half pixels on this, so you have to pick which one just looks the best for you. Here are the results of this print test for me. Here is the no reduction chip. You can see the ridge here. On the other end of the spectrum here is the tin reduction chip, so clearly it's eroded away here. And this is the two pixel contraction. It's pretty good, but it's not perfect. And the hole is completely gone on the back. This is because, as I described before, the light leak is happening from all around this, so those convex areas will still occlude. The next test is a pixel dimming range test. This one will reduce or contract the base layers by 10 pixels each. That's hard coded. But instead of simply removing the outer edge, like on the reduction only test, it dims the pixels there. And it prints a range of dimming amounts from no dimming or 0% dimmed to 80% dimmed. My daughter and I debated about whether no dimming should be 0% or 
So like, is 10% almost white or is it almost black? I had it the other way, but she convinced me that 0% dimmed is not dimmed at all. What do you think? Let me know in the comments. Okay, again, you can slide the bar back and forth to see each of the chips. So as discussed before, dimming reduces the exposure. It's sort of like wearing sunscreen, but how much dimming at the higher bottom layer exposure time equals full brightness at the normal exposure time. So this is what this test tells you. Here are my chips from that test. You can see that no dimming has the elephant's foot bulge. Then as you dim more and more, it gets closer to that normal level. And then as you keep dimming, it starts to be like you didn't expose those pixels at all. For this resin and these exposures, I think between 50 and 60 looks best. Again, you want to look in these grooves. Ideally, you want the bottom layer to be as square as possible in the cutouts. And you can see that at some point the circle shows up on the back side. So that's also a good judge of what setting is right. Two tests in one prints the reduce only test and the pixel dimming range test at the same time on two different rows. So you can save print time by doing that. The reduce with pixel dimming is sort of the opposite of the dimming range test. Where the dimming range test prints a single reduction amount with different dimming amounts, with this one you can pick the dimming amount, say 50%, and then it will print different reduction amounts. So that might be the last test to do if necessary to dial in the best combo. But in my experience, it's better to do 10 pixel reduction if you're doing a pixel dimming to counteract the problem with the holes and the convex shapes. Okay, now that we've done those tests, we know that for my resin, a good reduction only setting would be two pixels. And that about 50% dimming at 60 seconds is around the same exposure as 12 seconds at full brightness. So now we can bulge bust a file. If you're on the frozen transform, you can do the double exposure method, but honestly, I think the dimming method works even better. So let's start with the reduction only method. I'll put two seconds in for the contract radius. 10 is good for the bust layers count and click make busted file. I'm going to name this so we know how it was made. And then we'll print that one in a second. To do the pixel dimming method, I'll do 10 for the contract radius and still 10 for the bust layers and 50% for dimming and click make busted file. Again, I'm naming it so that I know what method was used and then we'll print that. I also want to point out that you can drag an already busted file into bulge buster to check the results, drag this in and then go to documents, bulge buster, and then the work folder. If you're importing a zip based file, like on the frozen transform, this folder will automatically populate with the contents of the zip. See all the PNG files in here. And then at the bottom there is the G code file. If you have a printer that doesn't take zip files like the Saturn or even the Sonic Mini, drag that file in. And then you can see this option shows up called unpack images. Click that and it will save all the layers as PNG files. And then you can go in here and view them. So see our 10 pixel contract is a little too much. This part will probably not adhere to the build plate. So when I print this part, I'll probably do only about five or six pixels for the contract radius. Okay, here are the results. These are the original gears printed with the elephant's foot. And this is what made me decide to do the whole project. But you can see that they don't fit together very well. The bulge is large and especially in the creases between the teeth. Again, that's because the overexposure affects concave areas more than convex areas. Okay, here's the double exposure version. Here's a reduction only version. Okay, and here is the pixel dimming method. Really the only problem is a little bit of erosion on the bottom layer. More experimentation is needed to perfect that, but for my use, this works pretty well. Okay, here's how to get the app for free. Go to nerdtronic3d.com. Click on Bulge Buster. You can download an installer for Mac or Windows. If you're on Linux, let me know. I do have a Linux version as well, but I don't have any way to test it. And remember to take it slow. This app is experimental. It's beta, but I wanted to get it out to everyone to play with. I do need to thank some people for helping me figure all of this out. First, I want to thank the guys over at Photonsters. They have a project I believe is called UV Tools, 
that also allows you to edit print ready files. Check out their Facebook page at facebook.com slash photonsters. Cliff Biffle documented a lot of the file formats and those docs were invaluable to helping me get this app written. Jason McMullen helped me figure out the .ctb v3 file format, which opened up support for the Mars Pro 2 and the Saturn. John Driggers helped with the beta testing and put up with me sending him countless test files. And finally, my friend Rich helped with some of the app development and helped to build the executables and the installers. So thanks to all you guys. Well, that's it for now. I hope to be getting videos out a little more often after this one. I do have the 8mm film scanner project coming soon. And then I have a project I want to do with an LED panel. But that's it for now. Bye.